Foundation, and um, I've been meeting with nine artists from around the world this week, looking at the ways in which artists can use their skills to call attention to some of the most pressing problems that the world has, and to really almost like doctors in an operation put their hands inside of the problem through their skill and offer it up to you. And we know that we can't solve the problems. So we hope to bring ourselves more often in the midst of a public so that we can build a larger, more compassionate, general intelligence. And uh, so such an artist uh, is Michael Fitzpatrick, who's going to be playing the cello for us tonight. And one of the things that we've also done this week is to bring into our midst other kinds of intelligence than artistic intelligence. We've had scholars with us, and we've had Rabbi Erwin Kula with us. So what's going to happen is that Michael's going to play the cello, and then Rabbi Kula and I will talk with Michael about good vibrations, the power of music to cause good vibrations, the power of music to heal, even bring peace. I see some people nodding their heads, which is fantastic because the most important part of this is the conversation that you're willing to have with us tonight. It's not in that model of us performing for you and then you clap and we bow, but it's really to get your sentiments about the idea of the power of good vibrations if they really make a difference. So I'll say something first about Rabbi Erwin Kula for those of you who don't know him. I'm Anna Devere Smith, by the way. Bodies on the Line is a, a project of a 501c3 I have called uh, Anna Devere Smith Works, which is based at New York University. So Rabbi Erwin Kula is not only one of the most influential religious leaders in America today, but also an important leader in civic dialogue. He is president of the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, which acts as a think tank and leadership training institute. His services have been sought in the worlds of business, technology, relationships, and religion. He's worked with leaders from the Dalai Lama to Queen Noor on compassionate leadership. He was ranked two years in a row in the top 50 rabbis in America in Newsweek and has been named by both Fast Company Magazine and Religion and Ethics, Ethics Newsweekly as one of the major spiritual leaders of today. Rabbi Kula has also been a regular on NBC's The Today Show, as well as repeat guest on The Oprah Winfrey Show. Very happy to have you with us, Rabbi Kula. <laughs> Michael Fitzpatrick is an accomplished cellist who has performed at venues including Lincoln Center, Merkin Concert Hall, Smithsonian Institution, and the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion across the United States. He has also performed in Canada, the former Soviet Union, Romania, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, Jordan, and most recently for concerts in southern India. He is the recipient of the Prince Charles Award for Outstanding Music Musicianship bestowed by the Prince of Wales. He has been described by the New York Times as a rebel marching to his own tunes. He has performed at the United Nations Millennium Summit of religious and spiritual leaders, the Parliament of the World's Religions in Barcelona in conjunction with the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Shirin Ebadi, and at the recent Parliament of World's Religions in Melbourne with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Michael is best known for conceiving and producing Compassion, a recording and film project inspired by the friendship between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the late Thomas Merton to fulfill Merton's wish for a better world. At the turn of the millennium, and after three years of planning, musicians and monks from both the East and West entered into the depths of Mammoth Cave, the largest cave system on Earth, for a five-day musical event in search for compassion. So they were down in a cave looking for that, and today we're going to try to find compassion here at James Chapel at Union Theological Seminary. And I should thank President Serene Jones of Union Theological Seminary for allowing us to come 
do this tonight in here. So thank you for being with us, and would you please welcome Michael Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Anna, and thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm glad to be upright again. I, I think Anna has been looking into the oracular sphere for quite some time, and the fact that she decided to call this gathering Bodies on the Line, uh, it, it struck me pretty hard when she told me about it a couple months ago. And um, I've certainly felt in the process of being a cello player in the 21st century, um, charting a path that doesn't exist that uh, my physical body and, and my, my entire being has been on the line over and over and over. And you get to that point where you, you kind of wonder, well, when, how many times can you break down? Um, how many times can you break through? And, and the answer is there's no limit because that's the resilience and, and the extraordinary capacity of the of the human spirit to endure the most absurd things and the most um, inspired things and, and also the, the most um, um, pressing things. <clears throat> so when I come into a space, and it really doesn't matter the space, um, my, my first question is, what does the space hold? How much can it hold? Or how much can it bear? And then I always seek to break what it can bear so that that other thing that's on the other side across the border can actually break through and burst forth like a, like a beam of light that's been a, a metaphor that has, has sort of pronounced itself throughout the week in, in all of the, the artist's work, one way or the other. Um, so playing that thing is a very kinetic, charged experience. Um, and, and my guess is that Irwin and I are going to get into the, the context of what that is and what that's like. Um, but first, I want to go into this space of, of these stones that, that Anna so wisely architected as the, as the stage set. Um, all places have mysteries. Um, stone cathedrals particularly have mysteries that were consciously put into place by the architects. And these are the things that our current world, we've just sort of forgotten. And it's like, why would you even think about it? So, I'm going to start with an invocation. It's for world peace. And it actually came out of this massive system of cave tunnels and caverns of Mammoth Cave, which is in Kentucky, which is the land that I grew up in and uh, fled from and got pulled back to and left again and finally decided, well, okay, I'm going to come to terms with this place and find out what's here. And it not only was a physical place, but obviously a metaphoric setting of the womb, the actual literal womb of this very planet that we are curiously and mysteriously on at this very moment in time. So I'm going to start with the invocation for world peace and then migrate uninterrupted through um, a couple pieces that got inspired by some of the other work that um, was revealed this week. Um, there's a very beautiful piece called The Swan, which um, is often danced to. And I have a, a different vision of how that bird flies, so I'm looking forward to, to letting that loose. And then a piece of Bach that was, um, I later learned, uh, ultimately, Miles Davis's greatest inspiration, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And he, he called Bach the father of jazz. And so it was a very liberating moment for me. 
and then um, yeah, I'm going to play the Ave Maria by Schubert.
I, I know, I, I met Michael a, a few years back in a cafe in Louisville by accident. <laughs> and just being in Louisville was a weird thing for me. Kind of Upper West Side Jewish liberal. And uh, we had this amazing conversation and the next day I get this CD and it's a remarkable experience to listen to and I have never heard Michael in person. And we were in Melbourne together and I had to leave the day before he played so that's a long way to go and not hear somebody. And um, so I, 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 at first I just, you know, I know, I know you're all here so you're just listening in for a second, um, but I, I need to say that, that I, for already, I guess, five, six years, your music has affected me. And then to be able to, to, to hear live, I'm, um, I'm actually a little unnerved and I don't get that way. So I, I simply just want to say thank you. I feel incredibly, I'm incredibly grateful at this moment. <laughs> So I guess we should jump right in, you know, right? Jump right in. <laughs> Just jump right in. Just jump right in. And, and you know, we've been, we're, we're talking about the whole week, talking about bodies on the line and borders and borders being these odd places that are absolutely necessary and absolutely necessary to transcend and, and places in which, you know, if you just look at all the verbs we use, you know, we defend borders, we preserve borders, we erase borders, we cross borders, we stand at borders and look, you know, there's so many different... Borderline. Borderline, right. I mean, there, there are just so many ways in which, in which we use borders. Without borders, we wouldn't be human beings, and, and with borders, we destroy a lot of human beings. So, it, and, I'm, and I was listening to the music, and I, I guess what I want to reflect on is, one, just the pro your process of, of your art, the kind of the music making, and, and then, of course, your vision regarding compassion. And then, and then how you experience borders, but, but one of the things as I was listening, I, I was, I found myself first of all, a few borders being crossed, and then you can reflect on, on it. One is, I felt my body hearing, not my ears hearing, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if that's the cello, because I don't get, I don't hear the cello very often alone. You know what I mean? I, um, I don't know if it's your virtuosity. I don't know if it's. Silence. I'm not used to hearing. I'm used to hearing applause in between, let's say, a, a piece and another piece, and not. And it's not only silence, silence this way, but physical silence. So I don't know what you're doing there, but I know it was a new experience. Um, and then also, the emotions that, that came through. So I know invocation for peace, and, but. Peace was really complicated, P-E-A-C. It was really, it wasn't nice and only nice and gentle. It was messy and, 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 a, and the swan was not flying straight 100%, you know? And, and, and um, it, it, the complexity of emotions, I felt like I felt peaceful and hopeful and then I felt cautious. I felt joy, I felt a little disappointment, I felt real yearnings, and then I felt satisfaction, I felt really centered, I felt unnerved, I had all these emotions. And so good vibrations, I don't know if it was good vibrations, it was a hell of a lot of vibrations. And so I, I, I guess I, I want you to reflect a little bit on, on what's going on, you know, when you say good vibrations, because you don't mean good the same way I think the world uses good. Good is more complicated for you. <coughs> well, it's the, uh, my friend Otis and the, uh, <coughs> my friend Otis at the bottom of the cup tea room in New Orleans said to me many years ago, there's a lot going on. <coughs> and there's a lot going on. And the, the ease with which the I don't want to indict anyone, so I'll say it. I was going to say the, the collective media mind, but I think it's sort of the, I'll go back to this idea of this global trance mentation. The, the, the easy thing to do is to make everything easy and neat. You know, that's, that's where we've ended up um, in, in so many places, uh, particularly in, in music. And so it's very disturbing as a, once upon a time, classically trained cellist, 
which is about a 400-year-old lineage, to, I'll just speak about the cello. It's very disturbing to hear the cello played clinically mm. all around the world. I was like, where did that come in? And how did that become the agreement? Hmm? Or like the cop-out, which is more what it seems like. Um, so the... There's you're literally doing things that... I'm not a cello expert, okay? I've heard of but you're doing things that I just haven't... I don't right. think I've seen, but exactly. maybe, maybe it's just that I'm not a... I, it feels like you stay on an, and it sounds stupid, then you'll say it's stupid to ask something else. It sounds like you stay on a note in a different way than I've heard. So, it sounds like... You know, we've talked about the time you played the Bach cello suite for another friend of mine who's a conductor, right. Laura Cartman, mm -hmm. and I told you mm -hmm. that when you played it, she was like this the whole time. <laughs> right. right? And, and you knew you were doing that, right? right? Yeah. And this time it was yet again different. Mm -hmm. So what are you, in the frame of your work, mm -hmm. your work is a call to compassion. That's, you know, right? Well, that's an aspect of that's it. That's an aspect yeah. of your work. Yeah. So when you say that there is, you're, you're looking to do something else with Bach, you're not just here to play it clinically, right. like it's played all over the world. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you're saying, what's that's going what on. What, yeah. that's what, what, I, what are you yeah. doing with that? version of Bach in this, in this space. While in still this being stuff. traditional. Well, you know, yeah. it's, it's tradition and innovation all at the same time. Um, you know, in one way of saying it, I'm, I'm playing the space, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm, we are creating it. I mean, that was the way it was on this night. Because of this collection of vibrating bodies, right? And... You feel us? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and and you feel the space, and so one of the things that, uh, in order to do that, I only I only know how to do it one way, to to do what just happened, uh, which is to literally cook the space, and the way you cook the space, and I'm going to give away the secret, <laughs> is with the silence. Once everyone gets that we're going to start from the silence, then we're all together for whatever happens. If we don't have that agreement, I, have, I can't speak to you and you can't hear a thing I'm saying, be, I have nothing to say. So real quickly, yeah. uh, one among us today talked about how you know, in New York City, people walking down the street, they got this going on, they got, you know, you know, they're on their bikes, da da da, they're, you know, boom, they're moving, it's mu music, noise, everyone's distracted, nobody's present. So you're playing in a noisy world, mm -hmm. and in terms of your bigger project, mm -hmm. your bigger why, mm -hmm. how do you work in the noisy world? Do you always require the silence? Well, this has been the great challenge this week. I guess that's why you go to caves. I, well, that's, <laughs> that was certainly the the um, sonic reason was to find the quietest place on the planet uh, so that we had no outer world interference and we could actually listen to the earth itself, not as a idea, um, not even as a, as a pious new age postulate. It was, it, you know, and it all sounds kind of hokey. I mean, I think about it sometimes, but it, it was, it was, it was about as, down to earth as you can get. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when you, when you go into the cave, and those of you that have been in a cave recently or have a memory of having gone into a cave, suddenly the you that you think you are is checked at the door. And then you feel these layers peeling away and just one after the next. So that was part of our initiation. I mean, it was a literal descent initiation. Um, and in this particular project that Anna's referencing, the, the Compassion Project, the cast of characters was 10 Tibetan monks and a, and a lead Trappist monk who had been a novice directly under Thomas Merton and a couple musicians with a film and an audio crew waiting somewhere two miles deep, right? So just the, the trippiness of watching the monks walking while they were chanting was, it's like, 
our molecules got rearranged, right? And once that happened, then we were able to like really come into this, this musical communion space with the intention of literally hearing the earth's vibration and creating a living music out of that. So that, that's in essence what I am intent on replicating every time I sit down with that cello, right? Um, how that f happens in, this is the noisiest I've ever heard in New York City. And I, I've, I've been in New York, a, you know, off and on a long time, and I have been unable to deal with it. It, it literally put me down. Right. You know, and so the, the idea of compassion traveling through sound is like medicine. And my desire is to share what I'm experiencing when I'm playing. Because when I'm playing, it feels like a current. Right? It's a very specific current of energy that is Sometimes it's coming straight down, sometimes it's coming from weird angles, sometimes it's coming from like all of you all at once. You know? um, but but, the, but the, the, the border busting aspect of it is this desire to, to send that specific sound out into the planet airwaves and maybe it's Maybe that's the thing that can change the frequency. So in that good vibrations category, that's how I hold it and, and think of it. And, and, and it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right. You know? Well, that, may, that makes me think, so we always say, I mean, you always hear music transcends and music, right. that are all that kind of, you know, banal. Universal kinds, language. Of universal, <laughs> the universal language. But then we also know that music can be used to a Nazi march, and music can be well, used to organize right. at the lowest levels. Absolutely. So that music is, 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 it's not just an ends, it's a, it's a tool too. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start, I think, at some level of awareness, right? I mean, yeah, well, you're getting, it's, see, I look at you, I'm watching, and I'm watching from the third row, fourth row, and it, it feels like you're, <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, you get into a state, it seems like you're getting into some state of, state of awareness to be able to, quotation marks, locate and channel. Right. And, and then you're hoping for the best out here that we're at some state of awareness that we're going to be able to use it for something, or feel something. I don't even care. You don't even care. I mean, right. it's like... Right. Really? Because I can't... It, I wait, can't, wait. Really? Well... I, well, I don't understand. I don't I understand. Well, I'm going to Suddenly, I don't understand. <laughs> I, don't, teachers, I, don't, I don't understand the Compassion Project. I don't understand why you're connected to the Dalai Lama if you don't care. <laughs> well, let me finish this statement. The Buddhist detachment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I can't afford to care because I'm too busy experiencing what it is. And so I have to have the conviction that what I'm experiencing is that which I care the most about. So okay. in that sense, I can't, I can't afford, I'm not... It's not utilitarian in that way. Well, yeah, and it's not where my attention while I'm, when I'm playing, I don't mean that I don't care overall. I care probably too much. You know? but I while don't, you're playing. Well, I think before he's playing. Before, he's playing. <laughs> all, I, I, I care and I carry it all the way through, but I don't care in terms of whether or not you're with me or not. I know you're with me, and I also know when you're not with me because I feel it. Right. So it, there's there's not a once we lock in from the beginning, unless some major calamity occurs. You know, somebody's cell phone goes off and then keeps ringing and ringing and then that becomes part of the thing, right? Which is then its own thing. Um, it, it, it's not a, it's not a, a dual um, um, It's not a field. conversation? It's a non, that's interesting, is it a non-dual experience? Is that what you're saying? Well, at that on, on one level, it's a non-dual experience. On another level, it, it's, a, it's a communion experience, right? So, there, there are all kinds of things are going 
simultaneously. Right? There's a, you are defining the sacred. I want you to know, if you read, if you read literature on phenomenon, <laughs> phenomenology of the sacred, okay, not New Age sacred, but right. like you said, the, the phenomenology, you have just, well, the awkward, I mean, mm. respectfully, the awkwardness yeah. of it, the paradox of it, right. that, well, I didn't mean it that way, but I mean it this way, well, I'm carrying it through, but not there, you know, all the, all the pull back and forth, right? That is the that is literally the description of what the sacred experience is. Well, let me ask you something really quickly. I just am blown away by it. What is thing. what is the expectation in your tradition the, of what words? Your father was a cantor. cantor. Right. What is it, the expectation in your tradition of what words and music are going to do? Well, I think that, I think it's going to be paradoxical. On the one hand. I mean, anybody who knows Jews and has been to a synagogue knows we have so many words, it's out of control, right? A normal person should go for an hour, like good Protestants. We have to go for three hours and we're still not finished. So there's, and I really mean it that way, it's not an accident. There's, yeah. there's a lot, a lot, a lot of words. And we have two fundamental traditions regarding words. One is, one is you can't praise enough. And so that's why we have so much praise. Or you can't whatever enough with words because words can't possibly describe everything that you're feeling. Words are finite, but your feelings are infinite. Your yearnings are infinite. So how do you get enough words? You just have to do And that's the chant, you know, keep going. And you say, what is he doing? Enough already, five words enough. On the other hand, there's the tradition. In Hebrew, it's it's shtikako I mean, that silence is the greatest form of praise. And so you have these two traditions in competition. Now, it turns out for us, the Holocaust killed the latter because everybody who mastered silence was killed. And the only people that came here were people who already, you know, they didn't have that tradition. So we're, we have an orphaned part of our inheritance. Right? That's one of them. I mean, we don't talk about that in public. This but is why was that? I'm just because, because basically all the people who were mastering the inherited tradition and bringing it into the modern world didn't come here. So they got killed in Europe. So we only had, literally, you can name on one hand how many people were here who knew that part of the tradition. They knew the enlightenment part of the tradition. They knew the word part of the tradition. They had the intellectual part of the tradition. But that, whatever we call that non-dual, mm. mystical, mm. The silent part of the tradition where it's most pregnant of all in meaning, everybody got killed basically. And we're paying a tremendous price, mm. right, as a, mm. as a culture, as a community, as a people right now. Mm. So, but music, here's one of the great teachings in music, that at, the, at Mount Sinai, the moment of encounter and revelation, what was revealed? 600,000 melodies. Mm. One melody for each individual person standing there. So think about a tradition that you grow up learning now, I mean, most people don't learn their traditions, but think about a tradition that, that says that the fundamental revelation mm -hmm. is your melody line, is your song line. And 600,000 melodies were revealed at the moment of encounter and silence. Well, this moment of encounter, one of the things that has inspired you, right, part of your mythology, part of what you are trying to reenact, honor, come near, is the meeting of the Dalai Lama and Thomas Merton. Who are you playing to meet? Nice. Who are you trying to meet with your music? <laughs> um. Well, I'll, I'll come in from the Merton Dalai Lama connection because that is the reference point for what we created. But it wasn't the, it, it's, it's more like a reflection point rather than the focal point. Um, so interpretively, the only reason it's of any interest to me is something happened when the Dalai Lama met Thomas Merton. An actual new consciousness like came into being. And it probably would have gotten lost forever or at least remained in the, in the, in the framed black and white portrait where many like it to remain. Uh, had it not been for the Dalai Lama coming to Kentucky to pay homage to Merton and, and physically go to his grave. And then he had a, he had a thing happen, right? And I, I literally just stumbled into it. I wasn't supposed to be in Kentucky. I was supposed to be somewhere far away. And so um, 
the, the idea and, and the, the, the reason I'm still willing to carry this project forward in its 14th year is could, could we embody in music what that consciousness spark was, is? What is it? Well, I think it's, I think it's some new form of compassion and love, but it's, but it's I, I like to frame it this way. If in 1968, in the many thousand years traditions of the Buddha's lineage, if the, if, if the living archetype of the Buddha had met the living archetype of the Gnostic Jesus, what would happen? You know, just imagine that. Imagine what is that? That's something is beyond our immediate um, conception. But it's big, right? What if Buddha met the Je Jesus? This is the crossing right? borders. This is the, this is the right. cutting edge right. crossing borders. Well, this is the place we, we talk about the cross of the border can be catastrophic, right. but that the cross of the border can be creative. Quantum and creativity. Much, much creativity. That's it. So, so you are a white guy from Kentucky who <laughs> studied at Juilliard and other places like that. Who are you trying to meet? Um... Uh, it's kind of like, I'm not really, I'm not trying to meet anyone. Is your music trying to find a point of landing? Um, it has. It did. It just did. And that, that's, you know, I was so talking every, with... So every time it does. Every, well, every time is the, the crisis. Every time is the catastrophe. Every time is the black hole. Every time is the cave of... See, oh my the God, the terror, and this is what we were talking about earlier in the week, the sheer terror, because you can't, I can't get in there. Because you're not performing. I can't get in there until I'm here with you all. And I've tried it many other, you know, many other times and ways, but there is, without you, without you, and if it was just one person, without you, I can't do that. That doesn't happen, right? So, I'm not, there was a time when I was trying to meet people. <laughs> well, I'm only but, talking about a meeting in terms of that, that thing that happens, that spark that happened, 6,000, 6,000? 600,000. melodies right. out of a meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, Merton and the Dalai Lama, mm. you know, a meeting mm -hmm. of some kind. Mm -hmm. So with your music coming out of crisis, right? Nonetheless, mm -hmm. you see it as a healing agent. Mm. Totally, yeah. So, tonight was the night. This was it, That's it. you know? There was nothing else, nothing else. Well, maybe we should hear from the audience a little okay. bit, so. You had spoken a bit before you started playing about the kinesthetic connection in your music, and I don't know if it's the fact that we're in such a vertical space, um, but I felt this going through my spine. And I don't know if it's a visual reflection of the actual cello. Um, I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on the kinesthetic awakening mm. that you seem to, I don't know what the verb is, mm. but pluck. Um, there was a before and then there was an after moment. Um, and when, when I first experienced that thing that you're describing, um, it was in a, a, a pretty um, uh, unnerving environment. Of, of, of a, I was in the middle of a solo uh, in, with an orchestra behind me and about 2,000 people in the audience in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I was 17 years old, and I'm playing along, and I'm playing along, and, and we were cooking, right? There was no question we were cooking. And long story short, I felt the phenomenon that you just described, but less as a, uh, it, it, was like a it was like a tornado. It was like a funnel cloud. It was um, gale force. And, the perception at the time I had was that it was 
that there was a tornado outside of the auditorium. And the next thing I knew, the tornado had seemingly come into the auditorium. It was, I remember distinctly, it was in the upper right balcony. And I'm playing along, and the next thing I realize, it's, it's like coming closer and closer, and all of a sudden I realize it was coming for me. Now, when you're in a performance state, you know, things are, it's like a lucid dream. So you're, all you can do is go with it, right? And the next thing I knew, this, the funnel cloud had literally come into my body and basically disintegrated me. I mean, I, I melted in this golden light of just like galaxies and suns. It was, it was way out there. Right? And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm playing along. <laughs> and I, I probably, I probably would have just dismissed it, right? But then as it moved through my, my physical body, I felt it move through the cello and I heard it change the sound of the cello, right? And that was like, that was the evidence. And then I felt it basically engulf the audience in like this giant wave. And then the next thing I knew, the whole, the audience and the, the, the performers on the stage, we, we were just fused in this, it was like we were fused in this golden light. There was no distinction between out there, up here, in here, right? It was just pure color and living sound. So I played out the, the rest of the piece, um, and I remember at one point I just thought, yeah, I gotta, I gotta see what this looks like. You know, I've got, I gotta check, I gotta see what it looks like. And, and I opened my eyes and I looked down at, at my bow going across the string and everything was moving in slow motion and it was, it was the trippiest thing I've ever seen. And, and it was so distracting that I, I just closed my eyes and, and kept playing. So that was a long time ago, that was 1982, right? So at that moment, I said to myself, I gotta figure out a way to get that sound out so that people can hear it. So that eliminated, in that moment, playing in an orchestra, playing in a string quartet, doing anything traditional with the cello. Maybe solo, you know, yo-yo ma kind of thing, but even that seemed like that was gonna somehow obstruct this path, right? Um, so all these years since then, I've waited, I've listened, and I've sat in remote places, you know, and I've done very non-cello playing things to basically allow my nervous system to hold that voltage at whatever level it comes through and just to bring it full circle because we've never talked about this. It wasn't until I met the Dalai Lama and sat with him as we're sitting here and played music this close to him for six straight days in a remote monastery setting, very much like this, that I, that I saw someone physically have grounding that energy, embodying it like no big deal. You know, it, it was quite extraordinary because I didn't know, I didn't know the Dalai Lama. I didn't know, I didn't know what to expect from him energetically. And so that was, that was the turning point for, okay, so there is a way to hold, to contain that energy in a way that one can function. As a teacher and student and a man in, in a secular world, in a spiritual uh, world tradition, how do you think about listening as the beginning of a bigger conversation? I mean, I think also when you talk about, I've only seen the Dalai Lama on stage, and there is, of course, a way that there is an extraordinary silence and hush, so that if he takes off his shoes, it's as if he just recited the most extraordinary poem in the world, right? That's real presence, right? How do you think about silence and presence 
and how a leader comes gonna, out of silence. You know, I'm, I, there's, it's, there's so many listening. ways to answer it. I'm going to answer it with a recent story that I, I think that, that Mike will appreciate. First, you know, the most, the, the only creedal prayer in the Jewish wisdom tradition is what's called the Shema, which means listen. So the fundamental creedal call is to listen. We have no other, call, we have no other creeds that way. Okay, so if you're a traditional practicing Jew, okay, uh, three times a day, you're going to say this, listen really, 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 really carefully, okay? The world is seamlessly interconnected as one, okay? You're gonna say that in silence, okay, with your eyes closed. So the practice of silence itself is, is really critically important when you can't hear, so there's no listening without without the silence. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to, I'll tell you a story. This is five weeks old, six weeks old. There was in Oklahoma, it's how I, and it's how I use silence, and how silence has become important to me. And it's, I would say, I have five younger brothers, so there wasn't a lot of silence growing up. <laughs> um, this is since 9-11 that I'm aware of this. I'm in Oklahoma. I do my whatever talk, a few hundred people there, very nice, etc. Person raises her hand, leader in the Tolson community, and, and says to me, Rabbi, um, I, I've heard that you, were, you have been very aggressive in, in, in speaking out in favor of the mosque at Ground Zero. Uh, by the way, I, I, my talk was not about the mosque at Ground Zero, it was the American religious landscape and how we make meaning in the light of new technology. Okay, so it had nothing to do with the Ground Zero. So she asks the question, she asks very, very nicely, like, you know, she's a completely normal person, she looks like. And, and she asks me a question that goes something like this. She said, Rabbi, so I, I want to ask you a question. And, and I ask this, really, I think I speak for a lot of people here. When, when, don't you think, I understand, she says, that, that you're in favor of this, and, and I don't want you to think that I'm a bigot or a racist, but I want to ask you this, don't you think if, if they want to fit in, now, I don't know who's the they and who's the fit in. I don't know anything because I don't know the woman. And, you know, and I'm in Oklahoma and I'm thinking, like, I don't fit in here. So, <laughs> so I say, uh, don't, don't you think if they want to fit in, they should just be sensitive to our feelings? And, and I, I, here's what I mean. Just, you know, when I, when I see or when I hear a Muslim, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. There's just three, four hundred people in the room. And I'm like the Jew, you know, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I'm having my own issues. Like, because I figure, Muslim, Jews next. And, and here's the story about silence. I, I mean, I felt emotions having, I felt fear, I felt rage, I felt uh, uh, a certain amount of, you know, we have power with words. I could, I don't mean it in a not nice way, but I could destroy her because I have the power of the mic. And I felt that capacity, so I felt power. I uh, felt sadness. I felt all these emotions rushing. As, um, I can't explain it, because it was like all of the emotions in one second, I felt. And, but then I also had to answer. So I said, um, you know what? Can we take 90 seconds in which it's perfectly quiet here so I can locate how to answer what I know is a really, really, really serious question. 90 seconds, but I need it, I need it 100% silent so that I can locate the answer. Now, 90 seconds in a room of 350, 400 time. people, and I was really, I don't know how long it was, but it wasn't 10 seconds. And, and in the silence, I can't explain it because all that happened was, and it, something came to me. I saw my grandfather, who's been dead since 19... I don't know, a good 15, 20 years he's been dead. And I guess more than that, right? I mean, I don't know, my, I'm looking at my wife, maybe 25, 30 years my grandfather's been dead, who came from Poland here as an adult. And what came to me was his face. I haven't thought of him in years, okay? I wasn't close to him, I was close to my other grandfather. He came to me and a story came to me that I hadn't thought of him at a Passover Seder, I don't know when, when I was 10, 12, whatever it was, they told stories about pogroms that came through town when, when he was, when he, and we asked him like, but what about your friends? Because he was a furrier. 
so he dealt with he dealt with actually aristocrats, you know, you know, furriers. That's like a you know, that's Jews don't hunt, so we're furriers. So so he he like basically we asked him like what happened? He says and he said this he said this to us. He said, Well, you know, the Poles are really our friends. Until like when pogroms, then they weren't our friends and then they'd be our friends the next day. And that story came to me in the 90 seconds. And I turned to her and I said, you know, and I told her that story, and I said, you know what, I imagine a lot of those really good Poles, they were friends, they weren't the pogromists, they were friends with my grandfather, but they stayed inside and then they came out also after the pogrom. I bet you there were plenty of Poles who said things like, the Jews just have to try to fit in a little bit. But they fit in a little bit better. And you know, sometimes the way they talk and, and the way they look it just makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Do you think she got it? I think, I think that what happened was the silence produced the space for the revelation. And the revelation comes in a lot of different ways. There's a great teaching that people could only hear the revelation in light of their own strength. So a baby hears a revelation in the way a baby needs it. Needs it. A sage hears a revelation in the way a sage needs to hear it, right? And so I think in that room what happened is everybody, here's what they heard. They didn't hear anger. They didn't hear dismissiveness. They heard personal witnessing that comes from being able to hear into the silence. If you don't hear the silence, you know what they would have gotten? Something like, do you understand that whether you think you're a racist or not, that it is so racist what you just said. And I probably could have ushered, I probably could have rallied the troops in the room, right? To say, I just want you to know how racist it is, okay? I want everyone to raise their hand who really thinks that's racist. Even the people who were racist would have been embarrassed to raise their hand. It would have been 350 to one and she would have been humiliated. That's what would have happened had the silence not provided the, what I'd call a more compassionate, but compassion doesn't mean to be nice. Compassion is the fiercest practice of all. It's a million times harder to be compassionate than it is to be justice oriented, right? Because justice is just fair. It's one for one, two for Law. two. Law is very easy, relative. Compassion, so fierce it's unbelievable. And I think that, so what did happen, and, and if I can tell from afterwards, you know, or so a lot of people bought my book, so <laughs> that was a good thing. <laughs> but I think that the, the point is, the silence is, is the place where the revelation happens. So what would each of you say to President Obama in a noisy world, extremely noisy and very noisy right now, and Washington is a real noisy place which is all about talking. Um, what would you each say to him as people who admire silence and see silence as a place of creativity, what would you say to him about silence and how to get it and how to find it and how to use it right now? I'll, I mean, I don't, you know, this is off. I would say, first of all, don't be afraid of gridlock. Everybody's telling you gridlock. Every, what everybody's telling you, think the opposite right now, because there's a partial truth in the opposite, and that's why. They, so when everybody's telling you gridlock, gridlock, gridlock is terrible, I say gridlock is, maybe gridlock is good. If we had gridlock before the Iraq war, it would have been really much better. We need gridlock sometimes. We have very serious problems. And very serious problems means everybody, from the person you hate to the person who you like, has a partial truth. So right now, it's very, very important for the leadership, and you're the leader, to hear the partial truths from teabagger to whatever it is on the other side. I don't know what the partial so, truth is. What's interesting about that, that, the other side of the partial truth is a silence. Correct. So that's what I would say. And second, thing, don't be on TV every day anymore because what you did is you wasted a lot of words. You, in the language of politics, you overexposed yourself. But I would say we have, there's a tradition that we only have so many words. And after we use up all the words, that's when we die. And I think maybe you used up too many words in these first two years. You know, 
you were on The View, and then you were on Jon Stewart, and then you're on the you know, Today Show, and then you're on 60 Minutes, and then you're, I, I think that- Noisy places. You were, you, you used too many words, so. Yeah, my answer is going to come through the last piece. Okay. Yeah. And I want to say about that, that one of my favorite stories about Whitman, I don't even know if it's true, uh, maybe Jane, you know if this is true, that supposedly Whitman, Whitman and Lincoln uh, never really sat and talked or hung out. Whitman wasn't invited over to the White House for the, something in the East Room. Um, and that Whitman, uh, they passed over the street, and that Whitman was saying what the president can't say. And so That's as we right. move, maybe we'll move now mm. to your piece. Mm -hmm. And why don't you say what the president can't say? OK. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say, say something before I say something. Um, so Irwin and I were talking before everybody uh, entered this space and I was recounting an experience that had happened last Wednesday night in Albuquerque where I was given a concert in which I, uh, it was at the end of, it was about mm, like two hours of cello and some moving images and but we were definitely immersed in this in this field and um, so the piece I want to end with is uh, it was hmm, may have been one of those 600,000 melodies mm -hmm. way back um, that over the many thousands of years, found its way into Catalonia and became a very uh, beloved folk song that probably the turn of the century, Pablo Casals decided to transcribe for the cello. It's called Song of the Birds. And it was the piece that he played as his cry for peace at, at the end of every concert. Uh, he played at the United Nations when he was 94. and. It was a, if you ever have a chance to see that video and hear uh, the distillation of a life, it's, um, it's stunning. Uh, but the thing that came to me in the space of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and things were wide open and it was, it was a very silent landscape and I had no idea. <laughs> I was going to be so jarred and jolted by the, the sounds of this city. Um, and then that's just, the, just on a sort of bodies on the line closing note, the, one of the issues that, that uh, I guess all of us face in our own discipline, but as a musician, how do you deal with the noise? How does, you know, if, if your whole goal is to be sensitive to sound, <laughs> then how do you, how do you, so I was thinking of the, of the earbuds and the ways to, you know, we close our eyes, but it's, it's difficult to close our ears. Um, anyway, as I was, less as I was playing the piece and more as the piece was coming from that vertical, I had this clear perception of, much as Irwin saw his grandfather in that moment, uh, I saw that melody, that Hebraic melody, that 5,000-year-old ancient sorrowful song arriving from the stars. And I really, I really got it, or it got me. Um, so the, the, hmm, the Wallace Stevens poem of mere being, when he says, you know then it is not the reason 
that makes us happy or unhappy. I don't have anything to say to the president, um, but there is a feeling that only the music can, can convey. And, um, so here it comes. <laughs> 